Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to another episode of our Aquarium Online Academy with Aquarium Live. We're going to be learning about adaptations today with our friend, Captain Joe, who's hanging out somewhere around the aquarium. We'll get to him in a second. But one of the special things that we have for Aquarium Live with Aquarium Online Academy is you can text us questions. If you want to learn more about something specific today, give us a text. Remember, text rate supplies. So if you're one of our younger viewers, Make sure an adult, an adult is around to help you out. 562-286-1838. Kaya is on question control, so she'll be able to help write those down, get them into the studio so we can answer all the fun things you want to learn about. But also Jen is going to be helping find Captain Joe here in a second. So Jen's going to be helping in the studio too. Hmm. Well, adaptations. What does that mean? Do you know what an adaptation is? Let me give you a hint. An adaptation that we have is fingers. Yeah. All right. Uh, here's another hint. <gasps> oh, <gasps> lungs. We have lungs. Hmm. So what, what do you think adaptations are? You can text in some of your guesses, too. Uh, no. What about shoes? But that's not part of me. That's just something I wear. Hmm. So an adaptation must be a part of me. It could even be a behavior I do. So like camouflaging. Ooh, that's a good adaptation. So all these things help living organisms, animal, plant, anything that's alive, survive in their habitat. Adaptations help them survive. What are fingers good for? Playing the piano? Well, yeah. That's not necessarily the most important thing to survive. It helps us grab and hold on to our food. Any more does help a lot more than getting food, but that's pretty important. Lungs, <gasps> they're good for breathing. So adaptations help things survive. Now let's see if we can find Captain Joe and let's start talking about other amazing adaptations that all the living things have. Uh, hey, Captain Joe, what what are you doing? Oh, salute. What do you mean what I'm doing? I'm making sandcastles. You told me today to find an animal that makes sandcastles, and that was an easy one because I make exquisite sandcastles. No, no, I said an animal that makes sand. Well, why don't we talk about parrotfish? Let's talk about the parrotfish. Okay, here is a parrotfish. They're a pretty interesting animal. Now, parrotfish are tropical. They live in coral reef. Here is a piece of coral next to a parrot. Wait, what's that parrotfish doing? That parrotfish has this really powerful beak-like mouth that it was using to bite the coral. That's interesting. Why would parrotfish want to bite coral? Hmm, let's keep exploring a little bit. So they only want the soft part of the coral, Joe. Wait, wait, wait. wait. Studio. So if the if the parrotfish doesn't use it, um, where where does the hard coral go? You sure you want to know? Because this is going to nope. be kind of gross. No, nope, just give it to me straight. Please tell me. Well, let's take a look. When parrotfish only want the soft part of the coral, they eat the rest of it. But what happens to it? They have to go to the bathroom. And so it comes out as waste. That's pretty interesting. Uh, uh, so I'm playing with parrotfish poo? No, Joe, uh, no, Joe, hold on. No, no, no. That's, that's the different sand. That's not, not the right habitat. This is the habitat with a parrotfish poo. Well, I mean, it's a sandy coral reef beach. So the beaches around coral reefs 
have some sand that came from the gut of a coral animal well, like a parrotfish. Really so what you're telling me is that the beak of a parrotfish is actually an adaptation to eat very hard and tough objects. That yeah. is really, really cool. That is really cool. Well, you know, we should check out more stuff going on inside. Yes, Joe, we have to go inside you the aquarium to hang out and do more animals. Pajamas? No. Well, yeah, we didn't get to the part about the parrotfish pajamas. Well, that is a very good adaptation for protection. And Pajamas now that are I fun. think about it, I think I know another animal that has a great adaptation for protection. Why don't you go ahead and meet me inside the aquarium? Okay, so what Joe was talking about with parrotfish pajamas are those. Those don't quite look like my pajamas. Or maybe your pajamas. At least I hope not. Take a look right here. This part right here is a mucus layer or mucus bubble that parrotfish make every night. Why would you want to have mucus pajamas? I mean, I personally don't, but there are animals like the parrotfish that need that. Now, what scientists have been re rediscovering, because we used to think it was more about protecting their smell so things couldn't find them, it is kind of gross to have mucus pajamas. Ooh. But if you were afraid of parasites finding you at night, Mucus pajamas would be the best thing. Kai just said she's going to buy a pair right now. So they help with protecting from parasites. That's an interesting adaptation. Wow. What other things could animals come up with to help them survive in their habitat? Hmm. Well, let's take a look at an actual tropical habitat. And let's see if we can come up with a few more adaptations that these animals might have. So we're going to go exploring in one of our actual exhibits right here. Now, this is an amazing parrotfish. This is a bicolor parrotfish, and it's about 20 inches long. Now, our webcam that has this lovely parrotfish, he wasn't hanging out on the bottom, so we rewound the tape to the highlight section. So here's our parrotfish. He's actually going to come up right next to the camera, and we can take a look at this very powerful beak-like mouth that helps bite the coral to get to the soft parts inside. Now, the coral that's in this exhibit with our very smiley parrotfish is all replica. We give them something else, like a plaster that they can chew on that won't be toxic and it works the same way as them chewing on coral. Take a look at how amazing this parrotfish is. It's like the parrotfish is the spokes model for the 1980s. If you were alive back then, you know what I'm talking about. Teal and pink, right? So good. Okay, so the parrotfish has these special colors, but colors aren't the most important thing all the time. Take a look at all these other crazy lads. What, what are they all doing? I, they're, all, like, they're all eating and going to the bathroom. That's one of the big things animals do. But what else do we notice about all these animals while we also look at his big scary mouth? What colors do we notice? a lot of the same colors among the fish black white and yellow hello he's very pretty very very pretty fish i also noticed that there's a number of blues and greens in here also with all of our replica coral so these animals have the same colors as the things they're near remember we talked about camouflage earlier well if you have a, the right coloring you can either confuse a predator into thinking you're not there or thinking you're bigger than you are or smaller than you so the colors really help. What I told you is going to get really close to the camera. I didn't think it was going to be this close. If you ever wanted to stare eye to eye to a parrotfish, this is your moment. He's very curious about this camera. <laughs> I love this parrotfish. It's a really beautiful habitat. Now, this is one of our new habitats that were remodeled specifically for this year where we're talking about coral reef health and conservation. So this is a really cool space that we get to talk about animal adaptations. Anything else you've noticed about this space that you might want to talk about as an adaptation for this habitat? Hmm. Mm, this one's not super brightly colored, but maybe that's important too. There's another parrotfish coming to say hello. Hello, parrotfish. The parrotfish really want to say hello to the camera. Did you see that big beak-like mouth? That was really cool. Here's an angelfish, and they have very different colors than like our streamer fish or our Moorish idols 
or just about anybody else. There's a very good reference Kaya found. Parrotfish look like a Lisa Frank design. You should look those up. Those are pretty fun. Definitely part of the 80s and 90s childhood, I remember. So let's talk more about adaptations. So here's a fun butterfly fish, this one right here. This one's one of my favorite butterfly fish because it has very different colors than the others do. It has this nice bright red tail and then kind of a brownish grayish tan body. And then that bright white stripe right behind their, their face, that helps break up their outline so animals can't find their eyes. If you look at a lot of tropical species, they have a, a band of color right over their eyes to hide where their eyes actually are. And that makes it tougher for a predator to figure out where's their face, how big are they, and if I wanted to eat it, what side should I start with? So having all these stripes or blotches of color on their body are great adaptations. All right, well, I bet Joe has found our next lovely animal to talk about. Let's check in with Joe and see what other animals he has found that we can share adaptations on. Hello, boys and girls. I am here in our warm water tropical exhibit looking for our next animal, the puffer fish. Now you might be wondering what different types of adaptations a puffer fish has. If you take a very close look at its skin, you'll notice that there are very small spikes surrounding its body. Now, say an animal like a shark or something else wants to have a puffer fish for lunch, well, what that puffer will do is get a huge gulp of water and it'll make those spikes stick out on its body and get very, very large. I don't know about you, but I don't think that's going to make a very appetizing lunch. That's a pretty cool adaptation, Joe. Well, it's not the craziest thing we've ever seen an animal Why, do. Why, yes, but... we have an animal like that very close oh. by. Now, the puffers He's... are big and round, but this animal that I have is very long and slender. We I was just going to ask about them. Right after you guys play a very fun game. So Joe is going to go find another tropical animal with some really fun adaptations that we can look at. Keep thinking about how color helps animals, and we're going to take a look at another animal in a few minutes. Now, if you're watching earlier today, if you're a part of our group that was watching about puffer fish with Kaya, you might have already learned about how they puff up to help protect themselves. We made a craft this morning about puffer fish. Go back to the beginning of the day with some of our pre-recorded programs and you can help make a puffer fish craft idea with some of our friends. Okay, well, let's do a quick game and let's see if we can use our powers of observation to look at animal color and shape and see if we can figure out which animal we're trying to show you. So, we have a very special puzzle. What animal could this be? Well, we weren't going to give you all the boxes right away. We have to figure this out together as a team. All right, so remember, you can text us your questions or your answers, we want to know what you guessed right here, to 562-286-1838. What observations can we make about our mystery animal? I see fins. Okay. What animals have fins? Well, dolphins and whales have flippers. So not them. Who has fins? A fish has fins. All right. So we have to look for a fish. What colors do we find? Hmm. It's kind of a tannish brown. This one's almost black over here. Hmm. Someone saw the pink middle section. Good. So we have pink, brown, and black. And it's probably a fish because of the fins that we can see here. It looks like this almost looks like a big tail. Hmm. What kind of pink and black fish is it? Well, oh, I think I might know. Jen, is it a... She said yes. So, great. Now that I know, let's see if we can help you find out too. This fish lives here in Southern California. We have a couple guesses coming in. What pink and black fish could live in Southern California in the kelp forest habitat? It even lives in our blue cavern exhibit. Well, Lillianne actually guessed correctly. Great job, Lillianne. This is a...
California Sheephead! Great job! Wow! Have you seen Sheephead before, Lillian? They're really, really fun. They're one of my mm, kelp forest favorites. Not all, I have a lot. We talked about favorites before. I have a lot of favorites. The Sheephead is a really fun animal because it has a very different life cycle than maybe some of the other animals we think of. This fish with this coloring right here, this is a male. This one also has big jaws and teeth to eat its food. Now, I think it, I may not be visible in Blue Cavern, but we'll take a look at our Blue Cavern habitat and see if we can find the sheephead wrasse. Now, all the wrasses, W-R-A-S-S-E, wrasses all start as female. And their really amazing adaptation is that some of them become male. That's very different from what we would think an animal could do, but this is a very normal thing for a lot of fish. Some fish start male and go female, like clownfish. Other fish go female to male, like wrasses. So they have very different adaptations and abilities than we might expect a land animal to have, but they're really, really interesting. Now this fish is a really fun fish. One of the food items they love to eat are sea urchins. A fish eating a sea urchin, well, it has these really big, powerful jaws to break through the spines and the shell of that sea urchin and eat them. When they get to be really large males, they get a really big bump on their forehead and their jaws get even bigger. Now, Jen's trying to find the right spot that we can watch one, so stay tuned. We're looking for that sheephead wrasse for you, but this is a very common animal to the California coastline. I've seen a few sheephead when I was out snorkeling in a kelp forest habitat here in California. So they are around. You can find them. And you do want to kind of keep your distance because apparently, there it is, apparently when they do bite things, because their mouth is so big and strong to eat things with shells, it can be pretty painful. So you want to leave them alone. But this is what a large adult male looks like. So we saw the male in the other picture. The females have a little bit different color. They're kind of all peachy orange. And they don't get the big bump on their head. They don't get quite the big tail and fin flare like this big guy has. So the females look a little more like a standard fish shape. Whereas the males get a couple extra parts to their body to really make them stand out as a big male. So that's a pretty cool adaptation. Changing sex. Because, well, sometimes as things get bigger... They need to have more babies. So if they can change their sex at different points in their life, it increases the amount of babies they could have over their lifetime. That's a really interesting way for a fish to survive. Okay, the sheephead went to go hide. That's okay. But that's an interesting thing to think about. There's a lot of invertebrates that will change sex and a lot of fish. And that's a standard part of being an animal in the ocean is you have to try and live your life as long as possible and have as many babies as possible and there's special adaptations that some of these animals have that can really do that wow that's so amazing okay i think joe's made it up to our next spot where we are going to get to talk about another really interesting animal with some fun adaptations welcome back boys and girls we have our next animal here a very small animal from our garden eel exhibit now these little eels use their long slender body to hide in the sand. They also have great color to camouflage, including two black spots on their backs. These spots are meant to look like eyes to scare away predators. These little eels have much larger relatives found in different habitats, like the moray eel found in our Southern California waters and the honeycomb eel found in tropical habitats. All of them use their long ribbon-shaped bodies to hide and find food. Garden eels emerge out of their homes to grab small animals as they drift by. That's pretty interesting. So those little eels, they're only about this big. They look really big on the screen, but they're only about this big. They have special spots on their body to make predators think their eyes are somewhere else on their body so that they don't know where to to try and bite them from. That's a pretty cool adaptation. Hmm, man, if only us, we knew about that, we could try and make more camouflage for ourselves. We've kind of copied the idea of camouflage from the animal world to use for ourselves. There's a lot of animals that have those false eye spots. Next time you watch one of our webcams, see if you can find more fish that have false eye spots. It's 
really fun way to try and figure out all of the cool things animals can do. Well, if you've watched one of our Aquarium Live episodes with Captain Joe before, you might recognize this place. This is our Molina Animal Care Center, our vet hospital on site here at the Aquarium of the Pacific. We have a vet hospital, full service hospital, right here for our animals. So not only do we give them the best possible food they could eat, they have an on-site team of doctors and vet techs, or like animal nurses, to help them out. We can have up to three vet doctors here on site. We have one full-time that's been here, um, I think the whole time we've been open, that's Dr. Adams. But we have two other vet doctors that might work with us at different times or different parts of the week. So that we have a pretty amazing team of people that can help out. Well, let's see what our vet tech is going to teach us about animal care today. Welcome, Ocean Rangers. My name is Shara Seals. I am a veterinary technician here at the Molina Animal Care Center, our veterinary hospital for the Aquarium of the Pacific's animals. I work with Dr. Lance Adams, our veterinarian. A veterinary technician is a fancy term for an animal nurse. That's what I do here. And today, we're gonna look at Heidi, one of our Magellanic penguins. She needs a physical exam. This is Heidi. This is one of our Magellanic penguins. We're gonna do a physical exam on her today. We use this, this is a stethoscope. We use this to listen to her lungs and her heart. This is an ophthalmoscope. We look at her eyes. And this is a thermometer. We have to take her temperature. Heidi's being very good. We look at her feathers to make sure they're in good quality so that she's able to thermoregulate, which means keeps her warm while she's swimming in the water. We look at her beak and her nostrils, and we even look at her feet. And we feel her belly to make sure there's nothing hard or anything out of the ordinary. Well, it looks like Heidi is in good health. She's pretty happy. Thanks for joining us, boys and girls. See you next time. That's really interesting. There's a lot that we need to do to make sure our animals are healthy here at the Aquarium of the Pacific. Did you recognize some of the equipment that was used in our vet hospital? It looks just like the stuff we use in our hospitals. Well, there's another observation I made. Let's see if some of you made this too. Did you notice Heidi's color? Heidi the penguin at that point was a younger penguin. So when it has just the silver to kind of white belly, so silvery back to white belly, that means they're juvenile or a young a penguin. They're not one of the baby penguins who are all fluffy. They kind of get a different coat of feathers when they're younger. And then when they grow up, they get a new coat of feathers new coloring so the banded penguins have that black stripe that goes around their chest and belly and when they're young in their first year and a half of life they don't have that color so juvenile coloring like this on a penguin can be really important to signal to other penguins hey i'm just a young one don't worry about me i'm not trying to do anything weird there's a lot of animals in the ocean that have juvenile coloring that simply signals to other animals that i'm not a full-size adult yet don't don't worry too much about me or it could be extra camouflage, so you can hide better. Or it's even brighter colors to make sure that everybody knows you need to stay away from you. So color and pattern in our animal environment is really important to help them survive. That's pretty fun to think about. Now, we should check back in with Joe because I think he's got another secret that he's gonna share with us about animal adaptations. Hey Joe, we've talked a lot about ocean animal adaptations but I want to talk a little bit more about land animal adaptations. Are there anything, any animals here that we can talk that about? sounds like a great idea. I've always wondered about some of our animals in our outside exhibits. Why don't you yes. go ahead and meet me in Laura Keep Forest in a little bit? Okay, that's really cool. We're going to get to go check out part of our Laura Keep Forest aviary. So we have a special habitat just for 
birds that are native to Australia, Indonesia, and Papua New Guinea. And we're going to learn a couple things that help them survive in their habitat because adaptations are pretty universal. All animals want to try to survive and they have some special abilities that help them do that. Let's go check in. Well, hello boys and girls. I have found my way to Lorikeet Forest and you will never believe it, but I just made over 100 brand new best friends and they're all called Lorikeets. Now, Lorikeets are special parrots found in Australia and New Guinea. They can be found in fruit trees in the rainforest because they love to eat pollen, nectar, and fruit. In fact, they have a very special adaptation found in their mouth to help them lick up fruit juice and pollen, and it's a hairy tongue. Interestingly, lorikeets do very well eating fruit, but unlike some other parrots, they can't eat seeds. Take a look at our lorikeet. So we can see the kind of different shaped tongue well, what else have we learned about today that you can point out on a lorikeet? Do you see any false eye spots? No, not really. Maybe a bird doesn't really need to worry about that. What else do you notice? I see lots of fun colors all over their body. Remember where we said they live? Australia, Indonesia, and Papua New Guinea. They are a coastal rainforest bird. If you live in the rainforest, how do these colors help you? Well, there's lots of trees and leaves and probably flowers and plants. So if you blend in with the flowers and the plants, that's really good. But also look at all these patterns on this bird. There's different colors and different segments and patterns all over their body. Remember what we said about some of the animals in our tropical water? If you can't tell the outline is a bird or a fish or an animal, whatever they are, it's hard for a predator to find them and want to be able to eat them. So hiding with camouflage is really good if you just don't look like anything next to all the plants and trees. That's a pretty good way to do it. Or you can be like some species of owl and your feather colors look exactly like the bark of a tree. So you perfectly blend in. I'm invisible. No one can see me. Or you can hide in plain sight like a lorikeet does and you're like, whatever, I can do whatever I want. Nobody can see me. Can't see what my shape is. I'm not a bird. That's cool. So different colors of camouflage do lots of different things. And the same rules happen in the ocean. Animals will perfectly blend in or try to break up their outline or have eye spots, fake eyes. So you don't know what, what side of the face. That's a pretty cool set of adaptations. Well, that's a lot of fun things that we've been able to talk about with Captain Joe today. Tomorrow, we have a whole lot more going on. We have our summer kids club continuing tomorrow. So first thing in the morning is gonna be the Barracuda Bunch and then our Squid Squad and Ocean Rangers and Youth Scientist class. And then our last class of the day tomorrow, anything can happen. It's going to be a whole lot of fun. Well, I hope you keep tuning in, asking us questions, and learning from all the cool things we're doing. Kai is checking the schedule. What's tomorrow at 2 o'clock? <gasps> squid dissection. Tomorrow afternoon, squid dissection. Woo! That's a pretty cool thing. That's a pretty amazing thing that we get to do. So tune in tomorrow for a lot of fun activities and crafts and different things that we get to do learning together here at the Aquarium Online Academy. So thank you from all of us here on our Thursday team in the studio. Have a good rest of your day, and we'll see you tomorrow on the Aquarium Online Academy.